All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody, and, and thanks again for joining us today. Welcome to the Environmental Insights, an expert's approach to site characterization with Surfer webinar. Hi, everybody. My name is Drew. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, and, and today we have um, a very special guest host with us, which is one of our power users, Zach Dixon. Uh, who is going to delve into his analysis of a site historical TCE impact on regional groundwater. Um, Zach will be using Surfer during the presentation today where he'll present his site characterization, including a model of the TCE uh, plume extent and determination of the groundwater flow in heavily pumped environment. Um, and of course, I'm going to give you more on this in just a moment. But first, I wanted to introduce our guest host, Zach. Um, Zach, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and say hey to everybody? Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'd uh, just like to say I really appreciate everybody's interest uh, and attendance today. And thank you for joining Drew and I. Yeah, thanks, Zach. So a little bit of background information about Zach. Um, in 2003, uh, he founded Dixon's and Associate, Associates LLC, which is an environmental consulting firm, which specializes in for, uh, forensic analysis and complex environmental data and subsequent evaluation of active, augmented, and passive remedial processes and, regula um, processes and regulatory progress. As an accomplished senior scientist and principal hydrologist, hydrogeologist, excuse me, Zach, with over 30 years of experience, Mr. Dixon has provided uh, expert scientific evaluation, uh, data modeling, analytics, technical direction, and oversights for dozens and dozens of environmental assessments. Um, Zach has also been published a number of times and also been involved in the development, design, and presentation of multiple short courses for the NGWA and ACLCA, um, all of which are relating to environmental engineering. So before we get started today, um, I have a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. So after the discussion of each topic, we're going to stop for just a few minutes um, where we're going to answer any questions that may have came up. So you can send your questions on over to me via the QA button that's located on the Zoom toolbar at any time. This is where you can type in your question and it'll be sent over to me where I can either answer it or I will forward it to Zach to chime in on um, if I feel that it's appropriate. So again, everyone, please use that Q&A function um, rather than the chat feature. This is going to ensure um, that I see all the questions in a timely manner. Feel free to send your questions in at any time. And uh, if we don't have time to answer them during um, the webinar today, um, as we do have a, a full agenda, we will answer all the questions via email um, once the webinar is complete. Now, we are also going to be recording today. So later this week, we'll be um, posting the recording on our website. And so we'll send everybody that's registered here. Uh, a link so you can watch it um, once we get it posted um, so you can uh, take your time and, and review all the great information that Zach's going to present to us today. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty here. Um, and, and as far as an overview um, in today's presentation, we're going to be focusing on one of Zach's case studies where he and Dixon Associates have provided a complete site characterization on the TCC TCE impact um, on the site's regional groundwater. Um, and then also he's going to provide some of his remediation suggestions. So <clears throat> today, specifically, we're going to be focusing on the historical um, TCE site um, exploration, uh, along with complete site characterization. Uh, of course, we're going to be using Surfer, so you can see this. Um, he's going to talk about the delineation of the TCE plume. Um, and also, we're going to talk about that in 2D and in 3D, where he's going to showcase his final results. And then also, he's going to give some first count of uh, first hand accounts of the um, recommendations derived from his surfer model. So, all right, Zach, um, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to uh, pass this off to you here in just a second. Um, doing so, can you start off today by framing the background story of the site and, and uh, maybe talk about a, a few of the challenges that you were facing on this site? And I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to you. 
and take it away, Zach. Thanks. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, yeah, so let's describe really briefly here. We're going to take a look at um, where this model sits currently. This is one of the views the model can display of many. Um, this, this model uh, incorporates a whole series of data. And um, what we're started off with, the reason this model needed to be created was we had a client that was accused of dumping TC into the groundwater at their site. And we're just gonna go, uh, this is where our model actually looks like in kind of its final form. But let's go start out with what uh, the model was that the water board presented to these people. So we're gonna go to this particular figure here. Uh, and we're looking at what the water board identified in their cleanup and abatement order for the thread lane property, which is located right here below the bullseye of the, the plume that the water boards created. And based on this analysis, um, they decided that the uh, bullseye was, you know, directly underneath the the um, property that was associated with the release. So first, let's go ahead and talk a little bit. Now we have a, an understanding of, of that. Let's just talk a little bit about the um, the geology of the area. The the site is located in the uh, Central Coast Ranges of California, um, and it's in the uh, the um, Central Valley groundwater, the San Luis Obispo Valley groundwater basin uh, here in California. This this particular basin is basically a bathtub basin. It's underlain by the impermeable sediments of the um, uh, uh, of of uh, <laughs> uh, impermeable sediments of the Franciscan formation, and we have overlying sediments that have infilled those uh, infilled those basins, which are relatively permeable um, and, and contain the groundwater. We do have purge zones and, and deep regional groundwater zones, but overall the basin flows as, as one uh, groundwater horizon. So we really see localized perch water, uh, but we don't see that across the whole basin. So here again, we have our, our model. And the reason that was important was to look at this regional groundwater flow that was applied here heading to the west. And so the really basic model shows a bullseye underneath the site that was really the only well-assessed site here and a groundwater flow to the west. And this is what we needed to overcome. So we wanted to look at what the forensic data uh, included. So let's just go ahead here and we'll go back to our model. We did quite a big uh, forensic analysis and data review to try to determine how they came up with that model. And, and we've seen this before um, oftentimes the sites that are best characterized end up with a bullseye on them because nobody else has done great work. And they end up being accused of being the source of a problem where that may or may not have been the case based on what we have with um, uh, the surrounding activities and how the uh, groundwater flow and those types of things were applied. So in this case, we had a, a uh, client that really had said, we did never use TC and we're being accused of this and they were gonna have to take a look at it. The model became important because the water board was very recalcitrant to our findings and we needed to make sure that we could, we could showcase what we wanted to do. So here in plain view, let's just take a look at what we've got going on. We have a commingled plume here. TC isn't the only thing that's going on. We've got uh, our TC plume is shown here in this direction and the pie charts represent PFAS, which are um, a series of chemicals that have been emerging over time. We're just gonna turn those, those pie charts down um, so they're not uh, bothering us here as we look at the rest of these, uh, these maps. So we'll turn that down. When I'm navigating this site, I'm gonna be turning down um, things like the pie charts and other items without turning them off. And the reason for this is when I go to the 3D view, if I turn them off here, it'll reset those views uh, in the 3D view. And I really don't want that to happen. So, because it, it takes a long time to, to redo them. So we're just gonna go ahead and turn down things and then I'll turn them back up. Right now I'm gonna turn down all the pie charts. So we'll get those things all turned down to zero. And if you see me clicking over here really quickly to do that, uh, that's what's going on. And then we've got our groundwater data, you can see there's quite a bit of information in here. So we're gonna go down and get to our groundwater uh, posting and, and turn that down, which is right here. 
and that one, and that one, those are pie charts, groundwater, surface post data, and contour data. There we go. Okay. Apologize here, I've uh, lost my particular uh, groundwater vector file. Okay, well, we'll just continue on here. Um, we go, want to go ahead and, and just take a look at where we're at. We've got the airport sitting around here. We've got our site, industrial site, sitting right here. And we have Central Coast Labs, which is identified now as the source of our, our location here. Um, in order to see all this, let's go ahead and, uh, oh, gosh. Um, To our 3D model, and we'll just go ahead here and look at our groundwater plume relative to uh, some of the other features we've got on here. And I'm going to go back over here. And we're going to turn off our bedrock layer. Let's see base and bedrock contours, base raster smear, base raster. Oh, my apologies here uh, for taking this time. Post smear contours. There we go. We want to turn that one down, and I want to turn. There we go. Now we've got our bedrock data off, and we can go ahead and just look at the groundwater surface relative to our groundwater plume, our soil vapor plume for the same data. And these are the PAF source area plumes, the PFAS, that were the source of the, the uh, pie charts that we were looking at. So you can see here, we've been able to define our, our groundwater plume pretty well with creaking and get it planked in to its full depth. And if I want to go ahead and just turn on here what we have for uh, borings for the area, I've got all my drill holes in there. We can turn those on. And you can see my borings will start to come in and we have a, a volume of data for boring. So this is the data that all the model is based on. And we have broken down into any of various categories. So I can say, I want to just look at where I had uh, soil data for USCS. And we can turn that on and turn that off. And you can see here, we now have all our USGS classifications and soil profiles. Um, if I wanted to look at say where my bedrock top is that I've called based on this data. We can turn off our USCS classifications and we can actually see just the uh, depths where I put my bedrock layer. And we're just gonna go back over here. You can see those, uh, those balls will go back over here and I'll turn on the bedrock layer. Uh, over here, base bedrock. And we'll turn that back up. And we go back to our 3D view and the, you can now see that the bedrock layer would match each of those borings that I hit. I should also mention here, we're looking at quite a vertical exaggeration on this site. Um, the environment, uh, just to show this, is about a 10 times, but just to briefly, we'll bring it back to uh, no vertical exaggeration to kind of show you how that's looking. You're looking about 100 feet of, of uh, elevation gain in between the bot top and the bottom of the model. So we really need that vertical exaggeration to uh, um, go ahead and, and see these things when we can come up. And I was running it at about a 10 times. Again, 10, and we'll get to that. There we go. And so now we've got that plume. And we can do some other things in here. I've created uh, different ways to look at these plumes, but but these are pretty good. If I wanted to show where I had data for, for um, soil, I can look at just my uh, TCE soil vapor data uh, that I've contoured over here. 
And well, I double clicked it, but we'll do it again with one click. And you can see all our soil vapor data has now come in with locations and postings and the like. And again, we're only broken down here, um, you know, only limited by what I want to see by how I wish to break down the data. So in this case, I broke this down into obviously TC vapor. Uh, if I had multiple areas, I would have done them differently, but uh, I could have done separate areas or one area. In this case, I only had one for the vapor. So we went ahead and de dealt with that. Did the same kind of gridding for the um, groundwater and then planked out the file to match my, my model. And we can also bring up, if I wanted to see my PFAS totals in soil, I could bring those up and you'll see now we're going to populate our, our uh, PFAS concentrations upon which our three-dimensional visualizations for this data is made. Um, if we wanted to bring in, say, the surface that you can't, can't really see there, um, but you wanted to bring up a, uh, uh, a map of your, um, your surface grid, we can bring that up here. And I think this should bring into our three-dimensional viewer a little bit of that surface. Let's see. Um, try to get down here with. Show groundwater map. Uh, oh, there, let's get to 100%. As you can see, I have a lot of things in here. It can be a little confusing even for me to, uh, there we go, there's my groundwater one that I wanted to turn off. So we can turn it off groundwater now and we can actually see, hey, the groundwater layer is gonna disappear. I didn't turn it off. I just removed uh, it from visualization in one uh, in the 2D view and, and it, it, it allows me to get rid of that here in the 3D view. So you can really see the, the bedrock bottom here and now our groundwater sitting on top of that bedrock layer and again, our, our identification there. And all the borings that have I have up here that are drill holes have their identifications up. Uh, in order to look at some of this in, in our 2D view, we might want to see things like, well, I might want that groundwater layer back. And maybe I don't want the bedrock layer. Uh, so I can bring that down to zero. But I have broken down sites into, oh, any of the multiple different sites. You can see here in my post data, um, we have many, many sites, so I can click on each one of these and show this post data uh, right here in my in my map, and we'll actually get a couple to show up here. Um, let's see, Coakley TLP. We've got our crown contours came up. Let's turn off the contours and. And we can just turn on and see different types of, and where are they? Oh, are they buried by something? Well, that didn't work out as well as I would have liked. Um, usually I can see those uh, come right up and we can have our, our surfers postings. Let's uh, just try this real quick. Shift down here and we'll just go like that. There we go. So again, with my uh, with my opacity down, we can see we have each of the borings now set by site, and we can take a look at those. And I can actually post all the the data for that. Um, we have the uh, the actual locations for all of them, and here we can go ahead and put that on, and you'll be able to see that we have each location, and I can actually post the data uh, to that. What we've done here. In an area where you, I need to zoom in, this model is made to be kind of explored. So um, you can see we have everything broken down by site, but you might have to zoom in uh, to see the different types of borings. They're classified by location, uh, groundwater, soil, et cetera. Again, only broken down uh, uh, by, you know, limited by my imagination to bring things down. And that really gets us through, um, you know, some of the basics of, of surfer into, uh, just evaluating this in plan view. Great. Great.
Um, you know, hey, Zach, I'm going to uh, stop you there for just a, just a moment. Um, and I wanted to take a, a quick break to see if we had any um, uh, wow. questions from the off audience here. So if anybody has any questions, uh, we're going to take a brief break here and uh, go ahead and send those on in. Okay, so I have a first question in here from Bruce. Thanks for submitting it. Um, he's not used Surfer for borehole data and what type of input is needed. And I'll go ahead and cover that real quick, Zach, for you. Um, thanks for submitting your question, Bruce. Um, great question. Uh, Surfer needs uh, either um, a collars table and some and a separate samples table or a collars table and a deviation survey and a, a samples table. And so all three of those different uh, data uh, types need to be combined together. And what I'm going to do is I will send you um, and I'll post you a, a, a link to some more information that has more detail to, uh, about those different tables. But it's a very simple um, drill hole layer is a very simple layer to create. Um, and then from there, um, you know, you can grid the, the XYZC data directly. So, oh, and it looks like Zach's going to pull some up. Is that what you're doing for me here? Yes, sir. This is the collars, basic collars table. Okay, th thank you. And if you could um, show your survey table really quickly too here, you can see that um, both of these tables are very simple, right? And, and there's only a, a well ID um, that combines um, these tables together as the unique identifier. And then you can see here on the survey table, we're just using azimuth inclination and measured depth, his or um, straight vertical. So that information's uh, really not needed. And then also he has a samples table. Can you click on the samples table? Do you have that that up? And again, this is linked by well ID. And again, Bruce, I'm gonna um, uh, send you a, a link so you can have some more information about that from our from our help file. And there's what your borehole data would look like from all. One of the things that is important to know about bringing your borehole data, and I didn't know this till I did it, is it all gets held into one database in Surfer. So I originally thought I could bring in collars and intervals for each type of um, subset of boring logs that I wanted to bring in. That didn't turn out to be necessary. I only needed to bring in it once and then bring in my interval data uh, that I wanted to sub subset into. Correct. That is correct. And you can create then multiple drill hole layers. So, so, um, and let's see, is there any other questions that we could answer uh, really quick before we, we let Zach take it back away here? Okay. I have one that you're going to, um, you're going to have to field this one, Zach. Um, this question is from Eric. Thank you, Eric, very much. Can you provide the question is Zach? can you provide more information on how the TCE concentration clouds uh, are being generated in surfer? So he's talking about the TCE plume? Yes, sir, I actually can. Um, one of the first things that I had to do to make those, well, let me start off this way. Surfer did not have some of the capabilities when I started this project that it has now. So originally, when I was working with another colleague um, to create these plumes, and we were deciding on how we were going to draw them and incorporate uh, the different uh, groundwater flow regimes that we had for beneath the site versus the regional, uh, we did this by hand. And so what I did in Surfer was I traced these lines that you see that I drew by hand um, with a colleague and we published. And I, I traced them and brought them back into Surfer um, through a geo-referenced file. And what I did to make that was I traced the outside line, the green five microgram per liter contour that I have here for TCE. And once I did that, I had a polyline. I had to take that polyline, uh, export it from its file as data and uh, as a DAT file. And then in order to close the polyline, I just took the first place I clicked, um, the very first part of that data file and copied it to the end and then saved the data file and brought it back in and it came in as a polygon, now a closed loop. I could not figure out how to close a, a, um, a polyline into a polygon in Surfer uh, directly. So I, I actually just went ahead and brought it out and closed it um, in, in the .dat file in Surfer and then brought it back in. I then used my grid filing to map those XY coordinates to the groundwater elevation grid that I had created. And they're in the same map coordinate system. And Surfer has a great feature for being able to take X, Y, and Z points and instantaneously, instantaneously map them to a grid you've created. 
Um, and so I went ahead and did that. And then I created a grid from that file to create the VTK file and, uh, and did a similar uh, idea with making the blanking file using this outdoor, uh, this, this five uh, microgram per liter contour. And you can see here, we actually got it to conform directly to the groundwater surface pretty much. Um, I, I, it was all about mapping to that surface. You can see there's, it's not quite perfect, but it was as good as I was gonna get it with, with what I had and it kinda, kinda sticks there. So it, it came across pretty darn well. I, I was really happy. That was one of the new features we had. And when Surfer started, um, uh, you know, when I started doing this model on Surfer, it could not have, you know, an axis that would cover uh, the, um, you know, both elevation and concentration ranges that you need multiple uh, Z axes to do these, but now we have the concentration axes and uh, the new 3D Surfer works great for that. And I will add that if you can get in a, um, uh, you know, point cloud model to help you uh, base your model off of, uh, you're, you're doing really well. You've got a great base. Zach, I want to inter interject there really quick. Um, what is Zach showing you here right now is on the plume um, is going to be, uh, this is a, a 3D blanking um, uh, process that's going to be available uh, right now for all the users that have active maintenance. And this is in the beta, uh, but but we're going to be releasing this um, to um, the full production version of Surfer uh, when we release the, ver next, the newest version next month. So for those of you that don't have active maintenance that are out there, this is something for you to, to, to check in on um, so you can have access to our new release that, that again, is going to come out next month. And so this nice little... Um, uh blanking that he did in in the 3d is is available in our beta and is also built to, to again current maintenance um active maintenance users so go ahead and check your maintenance if this is something that would be applicable to um your workflows all right zach go ahead and take it okay so um the other thing that was really important about this site i mean we were really trying to overcome a, a bad idea uh, that the, the regional board had and, and how they applied their understanding of the data. One of the things that was pretty important here was they applied a regional groundwater flow uh, of westerly, which is absolutely correct for the overall aquifer, but it is incorrect in a, the highly pumped area of the, the site um, that we're working on and the, you know, the neighboring uh, community where they withdraw water um, for personal use and, and uh, uh, you know, their household use uh, in the area around there. We'll just take a quick look here at the, the map. You can see we're in a primary, we've got a light industrial area here. We have all residential areas around here um, that are pumping from these wells and using them. And then we've got the airport. So we have a highly pumped environment here. And if we go back here and look at my, uh, my basic model, you can see some of that impact actually down here on this surface. Um, it's a little hard to see, but there's a small depression right about here. And that's, that's really where one of our major wells uh, that is pumping is doing quite a, quite a bit of work. And I'm just gonna show you real briefly the impacts. We have only one really good environmental monitoring well set in the area. We have three wells that uh, sit right in, across this property in a nice triangle. So we have a really nice well set here. And to just look at what uh, the um, hydrographs would look like from the, the area, here's a hydrograph set for a, a very significant period here. We're looking at about 20, uh, 21 to 2023. 20, Obviously um, a lot of data going on there and a lot of pumping going on. And if we take all this data and we boil it down to really see what's going on, we can see that we it boils down into basically a bimodal flow pattern across our particular site, our client site, the Thread Lane property uh, that was accused and had a CIO that 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 really wasn't involved here other than to be the neighbor and have a bullseye underneath them because they did a nice job of evaluating their site and and everybody else was a little remiss in how they did that. Bimodal flow. We have uh, even though we have a, a overall uh, westerly direction for this flow in, in this particular groundwater um, uh, regime and in this basin. At this site, we can see we have a 225 degree flow a lot of the time and 180 degree south flow a lot of the time. 
and the south flow is almost double um, in gradient what the flow to 225 degrees is. So you can kind of see that if in a certain type of environment, the type three, in this case for chlorinated solvents, oxygenated environment, this is going to have a significant event uh, effect on the distribution in groundwater. And therefore, you, you, you end up seeing how we came up with this kind of flow uh, pattern here as that pumping oscillates back and forth across the site with a much stronger gradient in this direction than in this direction. And again, eventually that uh, with lack of pumping as we come across or less pumping that uh, westerly flow uh, begins to take over. And so that's really what we have going on with those particular issues. And this was really a site about not only defining um, the extents of the plume by collecting you know, groundwater samples at all the wells that we could surrounding this um, without doing our own drilling, but actually going to people's houses and knocking on doors and, and putting in systems and, and you know, trying to, to minimize these impacts to folks. But it was also uh, really a lot about collecting the right type of the right amount of data. And in this case, the right amount and the right type of data was data loggers in these wells recording at five minute intervals for years. Um, to overcome any thought that the water board might have that there was some westerly flow when the water was higher or in non-drought conditions or uh, was westerly in drought conditions or whatever um, we were going to look at there. And really, as we looked at this, that became quite obvious. And, and uh, we knew that we had the groundwater part right. We needed to get the board to, to search uh, the site and kind of nudge them to the north, which we, we eventually did. Um, there had been a whole lot of soil vapor work done here, but it was done poorly. Uh, it was a passive soil, gamper, uh, soil vapor sampling program, took hundreds of samples. They did not um, use any control points of active soil vapor. And literally, if we look at the, um, the CAO maps here, I'll go down a little bit further here. If I look at my uh, CAO for, uh, I guess I don't have that particular one up, but the um, uh, if we if we were to, to go back and look at that, you'd see that there are dozens of soil vapor samples collected around the what was now known to be the hot spot, and they didn't detect uh, really anything. And so groundwater became the bullseye of groundwater became the reason uh, our particular client was accused um, and had to uh, go through the you know the remediation process and. Um, uh, and really defining all these things and putting in replacement water wells. Just about the time I got this model built, um, we had convinced the board uh, in our last report that uh, we were right, and they actually adopted our they adopted our uh, our model. Um, and we can go back over here and kind of see, hey. Uh, CIO, they adopted our vapor model, and they adopted our um, groundwater model. So it took four years from the time we got involved uh, to go ahead and get them to adopt these models. Um, and it took the model that we built to really uh, define what we were going to say to them and how these pictures were going to be presented. Um, we never did get to present this in a regulatory meeting. We, we had pretty much solved the problem by the time I got this model um, built, but it was the definition of, um, you know, the basis for all the graphics that we did, and certainly uh, is going to be um, useful moving forward if you had to, well, let's say I wanted to find out where groundwater was. One of the great things about this is I added a whole bunch of things here, in here. We can actually look at uh, where groundwater was encountered um, during drilling, where it stabilized, where it actually is, so high, low, current, and we can also look at, in this case, I've got the um, groundwater existing. So I'm going to turn that on here. So we've got our screen well, our screen intervals. Uh, we'll get rid of, uh, that's good, that's good. And so you can see here now I've got my screen intervals and where groundwater is. We'll turn off the bedrock if I have that on, groundwater, PAFS. So that's good. So, and, and we can actually see where they line up with each well. So I can get a 
really good idea if I have the information of whether my data is valid from any particular well. Are we sampling the bottom of a well? Are we sampling uh, groundwater that's within the screen, above the screen, below the screen? Or are we sampling stagnant water from an end cap uh, on, a, on, a monitoring, on a monitoring site? So again, just having a great understanding of your data allows you to go through and, and figure these things out. And we can portray that here um, quite easily. And I, I can turn on these and make them different colors or different sizes if I want. Um, kind of, kind of see what I want. We'll go ahead and turn off our, our uh, soil data because we've looked at that. And and by the way, with navigation, once you have your 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 plan view model fixed and you don't, and you're just using the um, the uh, uh, percent uh, uh, visibility to do things, you can click on and off anything you want in 3D view, and it'll come back to how it's supposed to be. So. And now you can see anywhere I have red balls, I would I would have some some data about what's going on with uh, um, where groundwater is and where stability is. See, Zach, I wanted to take another little uh, a brief pause here that we could answer a, a couple questions that have that have come up since since the last time we take a break, and then um, and again we'll we'll pause here at the very end. Um, and discuss any other questions that may have come up. Um, I've got two questions. One first one's from Tom, and I'll I'll actually um, field this one, Zach. So Tom's question is: Now that Voxler is retired, uh, are the 3D features being added to Surfer intended to provide the similar functionality for 3D modeling and volume rendering that could previously be done in Voxler? And Tom, you nailed it. Thanks for sending your question in. Yes, you nailed it. Um, we're in the process of moving all the viable functionality over from Voxler into Surfer, and you'll see with each release, um, which is typically a couple times a year, that we will have more and more functionality um, now available. And then if you didn't catch it from my last comment um, at the last time we took a pause, we – uh, we do release the new functionality that we're going to have in the next version in a beta version. And so we will have um, some more 3D functionality available um, in the regular version next month. Um, and uh, again, in the beta version when that's released next month as well, some additional funct 3D functionality. So right now we can we could do the – we have the same – um, volume rendering techniques, ISO surfacing, and um, you know, calculating volumetrics that you can do uh, inside of um, Voxler, and you'll see much more of that becoming available over time. Um, particularly the, um, let's see, what do we have coming up? We've got image slicing and block rendering coming out this next month, and there'll be some additional stuff that is going to be into beta that you'll have to wait and see what we have to add. For those of you that uh, are wondering if you have access, you can always uh, to these to the new functionality and new features. Um, you can always check to see what your um, maintenance status is at, at, by clicking File License Info, and it'll tell you on the dialog. And so, if you're not in active maintenance, uh, please reach out to us and and get your maintenance renewed, so you do have access to the new functionality that we're releasing. Um, all right, thanks a lot. And then I have a, a question for you. Um, this is from Liliana. Um, she was curious about how the uh, rows diagrams were being created. Can you go ahead and, and speak to that, Zach? Absolutely. Um, the rows diagrams were actually a bunch of fun to do. And uh, what we basically did there is we collected that data using data loggers. The data loggers ran freely. We, we measured them. Um, you know, we, we'd collect a, a, a measurement um, when we go out there in the morning. And I didn't actually do the field work, but uh, the fellow that did it was fantastic. He'd, he'd go out there, get the measurement, um, run around, and then, and then uh, get those out of there. We'd correlate them all to the, the nearest measurement. And then um, I would actually uh, do that in Grapher. We had uh, to find a um, – I, I, I couldn't design this. I tried uh, – we had to, divine, uh, to find a uh, three-point estimator. And if you do a search on the internet, um, Uncle Sam has made a three-point estimator that you can, you can actually find and download, and it'll handle hundreds of thousands of records. So I actually found that file, and I used the three-point estimator to uh, take my, my Solanus data logger data uh, that I correlated to an elevation and would calculate the uh, vector uh, gradients and, and direction um and magnitudes and those types of things uh fantastic uh 
project, and then and then uh, I go ahead and take that data and bring it into um, Grapher and and do a rose plot with the data. Pretty simple um, uh, data set once you get it done. And I can show you an example. I don't know if I have one sitting right here, but certainly I can provide an example of a. Uh, uh, then Zach, how did you then get those into um, into the Surfer model? Well, they are only in the Surfer model in terms of I've got a geo-referenced rose diagram for the site. So I actually, and I've been clicking around to other just to make it easy, so I didn't have to um, to zoom in. But you can see here I brought in a series of of base files here. So if I wanted to show the rose diagram, I could just go ahead and turn that on and bring up my deal and I don't see it come up of course um, but we have it sitting right here in the uh, the model is a uh, where did that go oh my gosh I just had it uh, I just have it sitting right in here as the um, there we go there's my rose diagram I was clicking on the wrong thing so if I, I what I did here is I georeferenced it to the center of my well die. Uh, this is the center of the only environmental network here. And so this would be roughly where that flow would be created for. Okay, so you can see the flow direction at that one location and then extract, that's great. Um, so I'm gonna let you, yeah, we've got about um, maybe 10 more minutes max. If you could uh, maybe give us a little bit of, of, of um, dialogue about what you gleaned from this from the model and and um you know what your what your recommendations were remediation wise that'd be great and uh um, then we'll finish up with uh, uh just a couple minutes of q a so thanks a lot zach and i'm gonna let you take it away all right drew um well let's see here the the basic insights uh first of all if you can if you have access to the data it's certainly worth putting in uh, to a model format. And, and if um, you have point cloud data to help you out, which is not always available for airports and certain er certain areas in the United States, but it is generally widely available, you can really make a robust model um, that can be highly accurate and, and help you determine, oh, where you might want to drill a boring and where you might want to set your well screens relative to the data that you have. So a very useful database uh, tool for, for future planning. Um, also very useful for showing to stakeholders, hey, this is why we don't agree with your model. We never got to get to the point where the water board where we had a meeting. We actually asked for a meeting for two years. A lot of this data was available in 2019 when, when the order was issued, but they simply hadn't looked at it. And even after we pointed it out to, over the you know, next several months of putting uh, conceptual models and remediation plans together, uh, and by the way, the work plans for remediation plan and, and delineation were, were a fantasy because we really, we hadn't identified a source and the model that the water bore had was the source was it was directly dumped to groundwater. So at that point, we we're really only able to use pump and treat as a potential option um, or something directly with groundwater. There was no Veda zone source identified at that time to, to clean up. So we wrote all those documents knowing that as we got into this, they were going to have to be reworked. Um, but currently, right now, we know we have a significant VEDA zone plume here, uh, up to 540,000 micrograms per liter in VEDA zone. If they start to take away this plume, this the, the source, this plume will collapse upon itself, um, possibly with not much intervention. Um, and the fact is, this plume has been here, was identified in 1998 first identified. It was actually, uh, its provenance goes back to the 80s and 90s um, when they were doing asphalt testing, uh, rinsing asphalt uh, with TCE to do some testing for road work. And they rinsed down the drain. So there's, um, even though we're in a type three oxygenated environment, we do see some localized um, uh, chlorinated reduction, you know, in these sites. So you'll get a few things like cis, uh, TCE, uh, DCE and the like breakdown products. But they're not widespread, and they don't. Uh, they they are persistent, but they the the conditions that produce them are not widespread. So um, you kind of have to have that understanding that we never did find the source, and we knew that there was some hint of uh, reductive dechlorination going on, just not at our site. So that was some major insights. Um, there there are definitely uh, quite 
quite a few here. We had a stable plume. We knew from all the data that we had that, uh, again, the plume was, uh, you know, started in the 80s, uh, identified in the 90s, and, and now investigated in the, the 2020s. And it was stable. It wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't getting bigger, but it wasn't getting smaller. And the concentrations of this perimeter were quite clean uh, and stable. So what we really would say for remediation is if you, if you focus on here, we get comments of, well, what's going on in this area? Uh, we don't have contours. We don't have control. How do you know this lobe over here is going this way? And those are really academic questions. If we take away the source, this is going to recede back to the plume. This is going to recede back to the plume. They start doing some vapor extraction and here will do pretty well. You may put some inoculants or some other additives into the groundwater, but I think there needs to be concern about, you know, um, uh, some other potential for producing vinyl chloride or other impacts to your neighbors that you may not want. So a lot of remedial options here, but the biggest one being get rid of that beta zone plume and this thing will most likely collapse on itself. Uh, you know, evaluate your groundwater using the existing monitoring well network and then see if additives uh, might be worth it. If you can avoid pump and treat, you always want to. How much air do we want to pollute to clean up groundwater? Uh, in this case, we know people are drinking it, but we are also treating it. Um, and then insights uh, related to PFAS uh, presence in, in uh, TC um, commingled plume. Very common. These, this is not uncommon at all. And PFAS competes with TC for treatment systems for drinking water if they're, uh, uh, you know, activated uh, carbon type treatment systems. So you really have to pay attention to that. We see that PFAS seems to break through quicker than TC does through most of those systems. So um, uh, depending on who's doing what, and in this case, you have one contract, uh, one one responsible party for TC, and one responsible for PFAS and and um, those costs can probably, uh, you know, the way they go about uh, allocating those costs and determining who's going to pay for what breakthrough at what time um, should be kind of interesting to see. We never really dealt with it that much while we were running the systems. We just uh, monitored for TC breakthrough at the midpoint. And if we had it, we changed out the, uh, the filters and, and moved on. And so that's some of the huger insights that we, uh, uh, you know, learn from from doing these models, obviously. And we can see where the impact is and what families are being affected. And certainly there's a lot of um, concern of the people living in this area about these impacts. I think that's, uh, that's the basics there, Drew. Great. Thank you so much. Now, um, I'm going to open it up one last time for any questions. So if anybody has any outstanding questions for Zach uh, or about Surfer, please uh, send those in and we'll we'll take just a few more minutes to answer any um, un, unanswered questions before uh, we conclude the presentation today. So everybody, please go ahead and send those on in and we'd be happy to answer them. I'm just putting on some pie charts here to show how to show the PFAS uh, contaminant distribution okay. as it's a bit difficult. Zach, I've got a pretty decent question for you here, uh, and I'm curious as well. And this is from uh, Liliana again. He, she is wondering how large um, is your search for project file? And then um, I, before you answer that, I, I wanted to, to, to uh, add in that um, – he is using a, a number of LIDAR files for the ground surface. So um, there's a ton of data that was taken from the 3 dep program. And that's also in the file, which does substantially increase that file size. So um, go ahead and, and uh, if you could answer this question. Um, and it looks like we have another question coming up too, Zach. So. Okay. Let's see here. Um, it was about a gigabyte to get this, this file set up when I finally took out the things I didn't like or uh, were redundant because of how I had, this model got built over years. And, and so that's why you see me kind of scrolling around the, the left-hand side a little bit. I, I can confuse myself even, but um, it's about a gigabyte and I did have to upload it, uh, you know, to share it. Um, I couldn't just email this to people, although I could do the PDF views and send those to folks. Uh, and that did seem to work okay. And then uh, just briefly here, I put up the pie charts for PFAS. And I just wanted to briefly say this was a great insight as well. Um, it's very difficult to contour PFAS data because it's so widespread. 
But here what we have is pie charts for PFAS data for oh, about 28 analytes. And then I just, the red, the red circles are PFAS for one particular analyte. And you can kind of see the relative to concentration. So we can start to get a good idea of where the bulk of the PAFS is. And then also um, how potentially remediation systems are impacting that and uh, where other contaminants may be more prevalent. Um, so like some of the firefighting test areas along the, the, um, uh, the, the perimeter of the airport uh, where they used to, to do some things, you might see higher concentrations of dirt, certain analytes than you would see in the remediation zones or in the places where we're a little further away from the source. And we've got a few more questions here. Uh, the first one is from David. What types of 3D interpolation uh, is available and which ones were used to interpolate the TCE clouds? And I'm going to go ahead and answer that for you. Go ahead. Um, so we have the same available methods that were done uh, or used inside of Voxler. Inside of Surfer, we, we've taken it a little bit further. Um, you can grill direct uh, grill hole, uh, drill hole data or drill hole layer, or we can do an XYZC point cloud. And, and your choices are inverse distance to a power local polynomial and data metrics. 90.9% .9 of our users are going to use inverse distance. Now, we do have full, full control over the gridding parameters, um, but you would need to take a look at uh, Inside Surfer to actually see those. Um, and it looks like we've got one more question here to answer. Um, and this is from Danae, and, and her question is, uh, how and if it was, was the model presented in a report? So the, the functionality of 3D is, is really powerful. However, the end game is quite often a 2D image in the report and document. And, and I'm going to preface this with a um, great question again. And um, it, do you think you could click through the 3D model real quick, um, Zach? And, and we have an export 3D button at the very top. We can create a 3D PDF from this, and I don't need you to do so right now, so I don't know if you have a viewer enabled or not, uh, but we can create a 3D PDF that can be um, put into a report that gives you full um, full rotation of the model and um, is easily shareable from file size wise, and you also can click off the different components of that uh, 3D model inside the 3D PDF. So this is kind of a game changer when it comes to sharing your uh, output with the project stakeholders and your bosses and higher ups and, and whoever needs to see the model because they don't need to have any software to view it except the free version of, of, of Adobe Acrobat uh, or any 3D enabled uh, PDF viewer. So uh, again, you know, when we create those 3D PDFs, um, we could send these uh, to the stakeholders uh, just via email because the files are so small. Um, so that being said, um, yes, often the 2D image is what's included in the report document. Uh, however, it can have an accompanying 3D PDF that can show the full rotation and model um, uh, uh, components. So great question uh, to name. So looks like we've got all the questions answered. And... Um, if you could go ahead and click to the thanks uh, slide for us there, Zach. Um, we're going to go ahead and conclude. So uh, first I want to say, uh, again, this concludes the presentation for today. I wanted to thank everyone out there for joining us, and I hope everyone learned uh, something new. And it's nice to have this insight um, from a remediational specialist that knows really knows of what they're talking about. Uh, again, later this week, we're going to be sending everyone uh, a recording or a link to watch the recording, um, so you can follow along again at your own piece, uh, your own pace, uh, or if you want to send it to a friend, you, you sure certainly can. Uh, again, if you're not currently an active maintenance user, um, and some of these uh, features. Uh, if you think we're going to be helpful to your workflow, please check your uh, maintenance um, file license info to make sure that you are currently uh, in active maintenance so you can um, have access to all this functionality and what we're going to be releasing um, in the early February. And so um, on behalf of myself, on behalf of Zach and Dixon and, so and Associates and Golden Software, um, we appreciate your time. And please note that we do have Zach's email here. Um, please feel free to email Zach any questions you have or send any of your questions to surfersupport at goldensoftware.com. And of course, our surfer 
Uh, support can be found uh, online or knowledge-based articles and webinar recordings at support.goldensoftware.com. Um, again, we thank everybody and uh, have a great afternoon.